Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the start over that tripped on the cord. Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of what I've been calling third party relations. You could also think of these as external parties. Um, a lot of it is going to be sort of public relations, media relations oriented, but I want I, I leave it a little bit more broad because there are a, a few other things that I can cover. But uh, I toy around with the title, but the, the main way of thinking about this is it's not necessarily the participants in your value chain. So these, this is communication with third parties, type of parties that aren't your employees, aren't your customers, aren't your suppliers, and typically aren't directly your business partners. So those would be people like the press, uh, public relations, media relations. It would, I also can cover some additional topics like investor relations. Uh, if you have a, a, a diversified group of investors, um, especially if you're a public company. Also government relations, things like uh, lobbying and regulation. Also things like uh, lawsuits and uh, legal strategies, although I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to get too involved in, uh, in the details, but there are some general strategies that I can go over. Now, for my sample here, I'm going to cover mostly media and press relations, things like interviews, um, but I just want to make sure that that's, uh, make clear that that is for the sake of the sample. In, uh, in live presentations, we can co cover other topics, and we can also hone in if there are certain things that the audience uh, is, is or that is particularly relevant to a given audience. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about um, the... Let's get started with some of the preparation that you need to do. And again, this is going to be sort of a, a media relations uh, basis. The first thing that you want to do is not overestimate your ability to communicate with the media or the press because that's a very different tactic than you're used to on a daily basis. Most business people uh, deal with uh, when, who they're talking to on a normal basis. It's their employees, it's their customers, and they're talking, the communication, the most important audience is the person they're talking to. When you're talking with the media, you're essentially talking through them. And the most important audience is not the person who's actually interviewing you or the person you're talking to, but the people observing, the audience. And that's a very uh, a different type of communication. And if it's not something you would do every day, it might require some training and preparation that you're not expecting. A lot of business people say, well, look, I'm a smart, articulate business person. Certainly I can handle uh, dealing with the media. And I always uh, recommend that if you, uh, uh, want to do that without preparing, I, I would recommend you go to a stand-up comedy show and start to heckle the comedian. Because within, you know, for the next 30 minutes, you're going to be uh, uh, skewered by them. And the reason is because they understand playing to the audience better than you would. And hopefully that'll teach you a little humility to realize that when you deal with the press or you deal with a media or an interview, um, that they do it on a daily basis talking through this medium and you do not and uh, you're you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage and there's a uh, several reasons for that as I mentioned first of all you're talking to the the listeners not the person you're directly talking to um, second of all it's not necessarily cooperative usually when you're in business you're talking to an employee or you're talking to a customer or a supplier you're seeking an agreement and that's not necessarily the case when you are dealing with the media uh, sometimes they're they're a bit more activist also, if you're sort of a powerful person, you're used to some people deferring to you, and the media oftentimes gets their incentives to undermine you, to sort of get a scoop or trap you. And, and so that's a delicate thing that you're not used to dealing with. And uh, I'll just use this as an example. When I used to work for Bain, the consulting firm, one of our partners wrote a book, and, set, and we arranged some media training for them because they were going to go on a book tour. And uh, he said, well, he didn't need any media training. He's an honest person. He knows how to talk to uh, business people, and he knows the topic well. And the person that we hired to do the media relation asked him, like, within the first three questions, deliberately, 
uh, rigged some hard questions. So the per so uh, within the first couple minutes, the the partner said, "I guess it's true. I do need some help here." So. Don't overestimate your abilities. Um, sec uh, let's go through some other preparatory things. Secondly, you want to consider the audiences you're talking to. And again, the most important thing is, is not necessarily the interview, but this can be your customers. Um, but oftentimes what a business person does is they have in mind a certain audience when they make a certain statement, not realizing that they don't just get to pick that one audience. You can ha talk to your customers or investors, but you're also talking to your partners, to your employees, and that can be your existing employees or your potential employees, as well as their representatives, the label, labor leaders or, or, or collective bargaining leaders. Uh, I use an example for that is Lee Iacocca was once in a business interview and he mentioned, uh, he complained about how many of his, uh, uh, the, the employee workforce in the auto industry was using drugs. And I doubt that they went to work that day motivated to build uh, great cars. So that, that's something you need to bear in mind is even if a statement is geared towards a certain audience, it has to play to all of them. Um, the, oh, I also mentioned, a, a, neglected a couple others, your competitors and uh, also oftentimes the community leaders, the people who, you know, if there's a factory in your town, they are interested in having, hearing what you have to say. And finally, uh, the politicians. And so you want to consider your audiences. The, the next thing you ought to do in terms of preparing is you want to consider the facilitator and you want to choose them if possible. Oftentimes if you need to talk to the press or you want to get a message out, you get to choose who to do the interview with. And you want to weigh that carefully. We're going to get into that in a moment about whether they're friendly or a foe. But you want to, you want to pick one that has enough scrutiny to be credible but, uh, not, but isn't incented to, uh, to make a fool of you or embarrass you but is really interested in hearing your side of the story sincerely. And the last one is practice. And if you hire someone to practice with, make sure that if they're, uh, they're either not a direct report because they might go too easy on you or if they are a direct report, let them know that they can put you on the spot. So those are some of the things you need to do for prep preparing. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is for the case of interviewers, let's talk about some tips sort of during the interview. And as I mentioned, you want to c choose your facilitator if possible, the interviewer, the press. And they oftentimes have a balance between friend or foe. They, they need to be have enough scrutiny of you to be credible. But if they have too much scrutiny, uh, if they're too critical, people won't come on their show or, their, or, or talk to their newspaper anymore. And so they have a little bit of a balance there. Now, as business people, you actually have a certain advantage. Politicians have it worse because in a democracy, they sort of have to go through the media to get their message out. But as a business person, oftentimes you get to choose. You don't, you know, you're not, since you're not elected by the public, you don't have to spend as much time speaking to the public necessarily. And so you, you have a lower level of scrutiny. The, the most uh, generous is if you're uh, in the entertainment business, because oftentimes they take political positions or policy positions, but then they go on to entertainment shows to talk about it. And the entertainment shows are very hesitant to ask them a lot of uh, scrutinizing questions because they're worried that other stars won't go on the show. Also, you want to be very careful to avoid what I call asymmetries. These are where you have a, uh, essentially, um, your interests are at odds with the interests of the person performing the interview. So for example, one of those is reputational. So if you are a large established company, a representative, uh, a high standing representative of a company, but the person at, or a government official and the person asking the question is not a well-known interviewer, they can ask you questions and take positions on things that are hypercritical, gotcha questions, because they're not really a well-known name. And if they do a sort of a, a, a uh, a somewhat sinister, aggressive job, nobody's going to criticize their professionalism because nobody knows who they are. Whereas that puts you on the spot. You'll see this sometimes when a, when a presidential candidate gets a heckler or someone from uh, uh, one of the, 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 the uh, web-based um, smaller uh, political uh, journalists, as opposed to, you know, if you go on Nightline, they can't take a ridiculous position and see if you agree with it. They, they have to treat you with a certain degree of decorum. Um, the other asymmetry you want to avoid is the asymmetry of, uh, for results. This is where you have the, um, the classic is the pop quiz. You want to avoid answering questions where if you get it right or if you say the right thing, it's not really that important, but, it, but there is lots of opportunity to, uh, if you get it wrong, the consequences are significant. And politicians oftentimes face this. Someone will ask them, hey, do you know who the president of Canada is or the, uh, you know, the prime minister of Britain? 
and they, if they get it right, it's not really that impressive, but if they get it wrong, everybody makes fun of them for not knowing uh, their colleagues. So that is a situation where uh, you, you wanna avoid answering a question where there's no upside, but only downside. And then the last one thing I wanna talk about here for tips on your interview is, you know, when you get asked a question, the natural response is you can say yes, or you can say no, or if it's not a yes or no question, you can give an answer to the question as it's stated. But I always like to try and help people understand your, your opportunities are much more broad than that. You can also uh, challenge the premise. So if someone says, you know, do, do you agree that you should stop polluting in your uh, community? You wanna say, well, now wait a second, you're assuming that we're polluting and I think that's unfair. There's a lot of uh, sort of traps laid in the questions themselves. Another thing is you can always refuse to discuss. You can just say, you can say no comment or you can just say, I don't think that's a proper question. This isn't the right venue for that. And you can also just answer with silence which is basically not even giving them the satisfaction of a no comment. That's difficult on something like a video or a television interview, but on a radio interview, uh, you know, if someone sort of catches you walking down the street and puts a microphone in your face, there's not much they can do about that. You can also do uh, what they call pivoting, which is where you change the, you answer the question, I always say, you don't answer the question that was asked, you answered the question that you wanted to be asked. Meaning you, you know, if someone says, uh, you know, t tell me about the reliability of your product. I'm glad you asked my, about my product. Let me tell you about how safe it is. You sort of switched it to your talking points. And the last one is you can sort of deflect it, which means uh, you can, you can uh, uh, which is sort of a variation of uh, the challenging the premise, just sort of saying, I'm not really sure that that's, uh, that's the right question that we should be asking. I think we should be talking about something else. So those are some trips on tri uh, tactics on interviews. Let's look a little bit at uh, what I call the games people play. These are some of the traps that they try and set for you. Uh, the first one I wanna mention is confusing the audience with the facilitator. And this is where I talked about earlier, you wanna, uh, the, your audiences are much more broad than the facilitator. If a facilitator wants to get you to say something sort of provocative, they try and cre deliberately create an environment where you f it feels intimate, like you're talking only to them. Um, oftentimes, if you're in a radio interview, they have a studio that doesn't really, you know, it's, it's very uh, intimate, it's small, and there's not, um, uh, there's no audience there, and uh, so they, they can get you to sort of say provocative things because if they talk to you long enough or uh, on certain areas, it can, it can almost start to feel like you're just talking with your friend and pretty soon you're saying something you don't realize uh, the audience is going to hear and someone might object to. Um, another tactic, another game that they play that you want to avoid out is the rule by exception. This is where they take the most outrageous thing about your industry, the most outrageous behavior, and say this represents the whole. Perhaps if there's a scandal where one company got caught doing something and they represent it as if everybody does it accordingly. And the response to the rule by exception is the baby in the bathwater. You say, well, look, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is just a few bad apples. It doesn't reflect the industry as well. Now, the interesting point is these are sort of the opposite views, and this oftentimes gets taken. It's hard for people to tell from outside of your industry. So, you know, if, if the public doesn't work in your business or your industry and someone says, this is just the one we caught, they're all doing this, versus someone else saying they got caught because they were the only ones doing it, uh, it's, it's not clear. So that becomes a debate, and this is, uh, you'll see that oftentimes in controversies, in scandals. Um, the next one I want to talk about, sort of the, the, the traps to fall into, is sometimes they accuse you for something just to hear you deny it, because when you deny it, uh, there is, it, it still attaches that story to you more strongly. And uh, oftentimes, you know, there's a certain cynical group of the population that will just assume there must be something to it. The, where there's smoke, there's fire. So if, if someone says, you know, is it true that uh, you, you punch somebody at the last meeting, you say, I did not, and you say, I did not punch someone at the last meeting. That makes it, that attaches the story to you. That's a strong sound bite. What you want to do is defer, get out of answering the question at all. And the key trick of crisis management, never repeat a negative. You don't, they say, even if you have to answer, they say, did you ever punch that person? You say, no. And then you immediately pivot to what you want to talk about. You don't say, no, I did not punch that person. That is, uh, that reinforces it. Another trick is what I call the challenger advantage. This is where if there's a smaller competitor challenging you as an established uh, competitor, they, they have an advantage in that if they criticize you or say they're better than you, uh, your intuition, your impulse might be to respond, 
but even by responding, it sort of elevates them to your level because now you're direct competitors. So you want to be careful. You don't actually want to, uh, if, if you could prefer, if they're a small, uh, unestablished competitor, you don't uh, want to mention that. And by the way, if you're the challenger, obviously you feel the opposite about that. You want to complain as much until you draw them into responding because that, you know, that's sort of a win-win for you as a challenger. That's the challenger advantage. Um, and then the last one, uh, a couple more I want to talk about, I call this the Colbert. This is uh, after Stephen Colbert. He, he's a, uh, basically a liberal uh, political commentator who uh, uses a satire by playing a conservative, to satirize a conservative. And I don't want to get into the ideology of which one you agree with or disagree with. I just want to point out that he, he makes an interesting uh, dispute because, you know, oftentimes if you're in an interview and someone disagrees with you, they'll try and tell you why you're wrong. And Colbert actually agree, doesn't disagree with you, he agrees with you too much. He says, that's true, and why stop there? I think we ought to even go further. And this puts the, uh, the interviewee in an unusual position where they have to essentially put limits on their own views by saying, no, I don't think we should go that far. And, and, and so it's a, that's a much trickier thing than just an honest, uh, I should say, a straightforward disagreement. And the last one I do is I talk about the law and order. It's kind of a variation of audience versus facilitator. If you've ever watched Law and Order and they, uh, you know, Jerry Orbach, the actor, um, is is at, uh, interviewing a suspect. They go, come on, look, I understand. You know, she was probably driving you crazy and you had enough. You got lost your temper and you strangled her. And the, and the guy goes, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I was doing. T finally, someone understands. You've, you've confused him as being the audience and in, in reality, uh, the facilitator as being the audience, when in fact what the audience was the uh, tape in the interview room that will be used against you in a court of law. And so they, they act as if they are on your side and give you an answer to provoke you into saying something that condemns you. That's also a variation of the asymmetry because uh, you know the, the policeman doesn't have to be embarrassed for taking the side of, of crime because it's understood that they do that. Whereas if that were a professional interviewer, uh, they, they probably couldn't take a position that was in favor of violence. And so those are some, some of the traps that you can fall into. Now let's talk about a few of my, a handful of my uh, uh, favorite tactics. One of them is, uh, is sort of the defense against some of these games. One of them is what I call the us versus them. This is where you try and make your, uh, the, the, the critics seem like they're outsiders attacking you and you, you rally support through affiliation. You say, this is un-American uh, because you want to make them seem like they're against the American ideal. Or uh, this was actually an issue with the unions uh, when a lot of manufacturing jobs started to move to the southern United States and the unions went there to try and unionize, one of the tactics that the businesses used to uh, obstruct unionization was they said, look, this is a bunch of northerner, they use sort of the north-south cultural divide. These northerners are gonna come in here and try and uh, tell you how to do your job and run your business. And so there was a lot of uh, pushback for that. Also, uh, one of the tactics I like, I call this the Dashel after Tom Dashel, who was a, a senator. And he was always, he was very critical, he's very aggressive, but he always, did so in a sincere manner and he seemed very thoughtful when he was telling you why you don't know what you're talking about. And the advantage of that is people oftentimes confuse the style of delivery with the message of the delivery. So if you seem sincere and convincing and thoughtful rather than just uh, turning it into a shouting match, people will assume that your ideas are well thought out and more sincere. Another thing you could do is the fight fire with fire. I talked about this a little bit earlier with the uh, rule by exception versus the baby with, against the bathwater, and that can be a, uh, a sort, a sort of use the, uh, use the other side of the trap. And the, another trick you, tactic you can use is I, I always say, uh, a lot of people will, when they're telling people what to think, they will always say it as if they already think it. Like, I think people understand that jobs are important to this community and therefore we should be allowed to build this whatever operation there that we should. And you're, you're essentially, you're, even though you're, assume, you're, you're treating it like they already think that way, you're, you're really telling them what to think. And that is, uh, that is a way of, uh, uh, essentially it, 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 makes it, uh, it makes a stronger affiliation with the audience that they feel that they already should, uh, are expected to feel that way. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about just under tactics is terminology. Uh, you'll notice that uh, for the discussion on the rich paying taxes that we have right now, the rich have been redefined by the conservatives as job creators. And just for the sake of ideological balance, let's pick on the liberals now. 
a lot of the liberals have referred to their causes as progressive causes, and you'll notice the presence of the word progress, because that implies that if you are against their policies, you must be therefore against progress. So they sort of try and define things in the most flattering light. And just uh, uh, in, in conclusion on tactics, I want to point out that, um, you know, a lot of, uh, th these do raise a lot of questions regarding integrity. I always say one person's per uh, persuasion might be another person's manipulation. And I have a whole presentation on integrity and how we rationalize. But generally speaking, if something is clever and serves our self-interest, we have a natural inclination to gloss over some of the uh, ethical questions. And so if you t look at something like, uh, you know, an us versus them, or a dash all, or an I think people, the, the question is, is this, is this persuasion or manipulation? Um, the fighting fire with fire, is that the sort of two wrongs make a right rationalization? And, uh, you know, I always want to point out that, uh, you know, if you hire a, p a publicist, they're oftentimes so enamored with the game as it's played, they tend to sort of talk, uh, gloss over some of the uh, uh, reservations about eth uh, honesty and, and, and ethical considerations. And one, one of the things they might say in their defense is they treat it like the judicial system. In our uh, judicial system, your defense attorney is, it's an advocacy system. They are expected to write whatever narrative is the most uh, serving for your case and strongly uh, advocate vigorously for your case without taking into consideration society as a whole. They are an advocate for you. And if you adopt that view in your public relations, your media relations, that is one view, but I think it's reasonable to ask yourself if that serves, if, if, always, if that serves society's best interest, always being the most aggressive in um, advocating your own self-interest. Uh, so I want to end on that note because I think that's an important one to bear in mind as you think through your third party relations. Um, I have a lot more to say on this uh, in a live presentation, particularly on some of the tricks and some of the tactics that you can use to defend against them. And if you think uh, you'd like to hear something like this, please contact me at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you. That's a long one. Oh.